gastronology is all about delicious and healthy food for everyone. Um, it was founded uh, by myself um, um, uh, three years ago. Um, my other role is that I'm the owner of the Budelpack Group, which is an international group of packing companies who are packing food products on behalf of third parties. Uh, and we do that on several locations in, in Europe. Um, out of this activity, I started uh, Gastronology. Uh, we are located in the Netherlands, uh, in the south, which is the city of bergen op zoom which is in the middle of uh, Antwerp and Rotterdam. Um, since 2019, we are working on the development of 3D food recipes, 3D food designs, and uh, 3D food production technology. So that's the three pillars of Gastronology's um, business. Um, we have a dream, and the dream that we have is to make tasty and healthy food available for everyone, uh, which is honestly uh, not the case today. So there are a few people, which I will share more about in a minute, who cannot enjoy tasty and healthy food today. And we'd like to give them the access to this healthy and uh, delicious, tasty food. Um, We have uh, three target groups um, where we are uh, um, uh, aiming our business at. Uh, the first target group is um, uh, dysphagia patients, which are the people that are having chewing and swallowing problems. Um, Bianca just mentioned it in her presentation as well. And, and this is the focus of my presentation today. Uh, the second target group that we have is children in the age of four to 12. Uh, they don't necessarily have an issue uh, in terms of swallowing or chewing. Uh, it's just um, uh, common information and, and uh, proven from many market surveys that children generally don't eat enough vegetables. And vegetables is where we have our core business. The third target group uh, that is really our big, big dream is uh, we want to serve oncology patients, uh, people who are suffering from uh, taste and, and, and um, smell disorders because they are having treatments against uh, cancer. Uh, and this is the area of personalized nutrition, which is already touched upon uh, previously uh, in the presentations. Um, so gastronology, which is basically uh, a gastronomy um, based on a new technology, um, is, is all about recipe development. And the recipe developments are being done with uh, uh, Master Chef Eugène Swalen, who is joining us today as well. Uh, he is our Master Chef in, in Dutch, it's called SVH, which is the, the highest level of uh, Master Chef that you can achieve from an education point of view. Um, he has a very impressive resume, uh, worked for several uh, one and two star restaurants in the Netherlands, uh, as well as in Belgium. Uh, I think the main achievement on his resume is that he uh, uh, he um, was responsible for the, I would say, the, the, the goodbye or farewell dinner from the Dutch queen when, you, when she was um, handing over to her son. Um, and this, this uh, big farewell dinner was uh, being joined by uh, over 150 uh, royal um, attendants from, from globally, and he was responsible for the uh, complete dinner there together with uh, over 150 uh, other chefs. So what what is it that we are doing? Um, we'd like to offer a natural shape, fresh vegetables, natural taste, uh, but it can be eaten with a spoon. And that's what I would like to share with you when we talk about the dysphagia patients. Um, we also would like to uh, make fresh and colored vegetables. Uh, this is specifically for the second target group of children in the age of four to 12, just as an example. So how does it work what we do today? Uh, Gastronology is a development company and, and how um, we are not actually producing ourselves. Maybe it's good to mention that the production of our products and our product range is being outsourced to so-called contract manufacturers. But how does that process of manufacturing work? Uh, the first step is that we start from fresh vegetables. So we start at the farm or an other source. And I think it's good to mention. So we start with the really fresh vegetables. Out of these vegetables, the first step is that we are making the fresh puree. Um, after we've made the puree, 
the, the other step is the efficient 3D put, food printing. Um, well, you know all about it um, since you're in this, this world. Um, that is step number three. Step number four is after we have printed the product, we are going to uh, deep frost the product. So our philosophy is that we uh, finally sell a finished deep frozen product to the end users. So our philosophy is not to sell the printers for consumers or clients at home or in restaurants or in the care centers or hospitals, but our philosophy is to sell a finished deep frozen product. And the only thing that the end users have to do is to heat up the product. So they have to heat up or regenerate, as they call it, the potatoes and the uh, carrots, uh, sausages, etc. So that's the process that we are aiming for. We are working with a lot of partners. I mean, 3D footprinting is all about development, research, uh, co-innovation, uh, and, and a lot of new things. So there's not one single day that we are uh, not dealing with new challenges. Uh, we are working together with uh, Wageningen University in research. We are working together with uh, the University of Applied Science in, in Den Bosch. We are working with Tino in the same cooperation as Wageningen, with Ruitenberg, who is joining today, Lem Westen. And very important, we also working together with a lot of care centers. Uh, I will explain about the dysphagia patients in the next slides. Uh, dysphagia patients are quite often living in these care centers. So it's, it's crucial and, and, and very elementary that we work together with these care centers. Uh, and, and Groenhuizen and Tante Louise and Maizo are Dutch-based or Netherlands-based care centers um, who give us access to their clients. What is our timeline? Um, we have uh, the ambition to, uh, to launch next year, 2022, in the second quarter, uh, a full product range, uh, as well as the production line should be completely ready. The target that we have is that we can produce 2,500 kilos of freshly printed, uh, 3D printed vegetables per day, which is a challenging goal. And for this, we are developing our own industrial printing technique. Uh, this afternoon, we've been talking a lot about uh, printing speeds and can we do the heating during the printing. Um, currently, we are in, in our desktop printers. We are somewhere at 35 gram to 45 gram per minute uh, as a printing speed. Um, the, the goal that we have is if you talk about 2,500 kilos per day, is that we can achieve a bit more than two kilos per minute, where today we are at 35 to 45 gram. And we're sure and we're convinced that we can achieve the speed. Uh, the first prototype of our industrial food printer, so to explain that the industrial food printer is not a print farm as we call it, it's really an industrial printer. The first prototype will be ready in about uh, two or three weeks, um, which will already be able to do 700 grams per minute. So that's quite impressive speed. Um, and, and if we are able to do this, and I think we can, then we are already at one third of our target for next year. So next year, what you see in Q2 is that we should be able to have this full production line uh, ready. So the Segia patients, uh, why are we doing this? Um, Today, the dysphagia patients are uh, eating blended food, uh, which is really not appealing. Uh, it's, it's a shapeless mesh. It's unrec unrecognizable taste. And um, uh, like Peter said in my introduction, um, what I like is the, the show, social interaction and the social responsibility that we can have for 3D food printing. Because today, those dysphagia patients, they are not enjoying their food at all. They are missing out on social eating moments. You know, the eating for us, for each of us is really important, but for those people, it's really a necessary, uh, a necessary uh, where they prefer rather not to because it's, well, not tasty. So I want to share with you a few slides, um, and I would appreciate it if you could try to answer this question in the chat room. You know? So I will show you three slides, each of them showing what they, uh, those dysphagia patients are getting on the dish today. Any of you, if you see this picture, do you have any idea what those people are getting on their dish? Does any one of you has an idea? Because this is what they get today. 
for me, it's quite hard to open the chat room and share the presentation at the same time, but I think I'm, some answers uh, are coming in. Beef and potatoes, potato, chicken and carrot. Well, I'll show you the answer. It's the Bami with the Babi Pangang. I think it's a good example that it is not being recognized anymore. So your senses are not being uh, triggered anymore. I'll show you another one. Anyone has an idea what this is? This is, again, a real life example of what they are getting as a dinner today. Anyone has an idea? Shepherd's pie is one of the suggestions. Beef with rice, saute. It's always a question mark, eh? spaghetti bolognese. So these are mashed potatoes, cauliflower, meatballs. It's not really appealing, eh, what they had. Final, uh, final slide. I think this is the ugliest one of the three that I'm going to show you. Curry, yeah, it looks like vomit. It does indeed. Dessert. So this is a meatball with gravy. So what you see on the left is what you when you uh, what you get when you put it in a blender, and this is what these phagia patients are getting. And this is really the biggest dream that we have. How can we solve the problem for these patients? How can we serve them? delicious and tasty food again and this is what i will show you in other pictures we've done testing together with uh, the uh, university of applied sciences uh, has in in the netherlands um, we've done several tests at four different locations with uh, six to eight people with dysphagia um, different kinds of dysphagia by the way uh, huntington ms or just because of their age we also did the tests with uh, the cooks the dietitians the therapist, the caregivers. Um, so you've got this, let's say, inner circle of clients that have to eat it themselves, but there's also this, let's say, outer circle of all people surrounding uh, these clients, like the dietitians and, and cooks, etc. cetera. Um, really interesting is that uh, um, we, we, we did those tests with them and um, Many of know will you need the Etsy framework, so it, it should determine the level of uh, chewing and swallowing problems that they have. Today, it's still not a very common um, level um, that is being determined per client, so it's a trial and error today. Um, and this is what we tested as well. So what level of the figure do they have? I'll move on to the next one. Um, if you look at the eating experience that they have today on the on the left, uh, picture it shows social taste because we have to taste the food the old days the question we ask them is what is your eating experience today and the, the main answer that they give us is be simply because we have to um, we'd like to have tasty food but it is not tasty it's not appealing we have to we are eating because we have to um, if you look at the second the right picture on the right um, we asked the the, the people surrounding those clients, um, what is the eating experience according to you? And uh, well, of course, they would like to have a good smell. They would like to have a good taste, tasty food. The appearance should be right. The meal experience should be right. And it should be a social activity, uh, which it is not today, as you have seen from the dishes that I showed you. In the test that we did with these dysphagia patients, we had very positive reactions from both the participants and, and those involved. Um, of course, there were some learnings. Uh, the, the recipes were not yet optimal yet uh, at the time of testing, and we are currently optimizing them. Uh, some participants uh, um, were suffering from the stickiness of the recipes. Um, and what we, what we saw is that the, the older they were, the more they were suffering from the stickiness. Um, so it is important that we are improving this and we are talking to also external suppliers to improve the recipes and, and reduce the stickiness. Uh, patients with dementia could benefit greatly, um, uh, especially because they can recognize the food. Um, 
I, I would have preferred to show you a video of how the response of those clients was today, because we really had clients crying when they could recognize the product, when they smelled the original product, when they tasted the original product, but still could eat all their food with a with a spoon. Uh, but unfortunately, due to privacy reasons, we can't show these videos. But the the outcomes were. Uh, really touchy that I think that's the right word I should say. Uh, this is one picture that I can share with you because we asked approval on the test that we did. Um, during one of the tests we uh, served uh, the, the carrots, 3D printed carrots, and we served a 3D printed broccoli, which you can see on the dish. We also served a 3D printed lasagna. Um, and, and the responses were again, as I said, uh, really, really positive. So it looks appealing. Um, and they could recognize the product. That's the first start. So even before they start to eat, they could already recognize it. It was delicious. They, they liked the authentic flavors, recognizable shapes. And what is really uh, interesting to see is that they were rejoining the normal daily routine. So if you are a dysphagia patient, you often don't eat together with your uh, roommates or housemates uh, in, in, in one room because, well, you are suffering from from some issues, uh, so they often eat apart, but by offering them the 3D printed products, they uh, they are let's say, rejoining the table. So really, really interesting uh, to see. So this is what I wanted to share with you. Uh, I mean, there's a lot to talk about, a lot to share, but um, uh, yeah, we are working on our dream and, and this is what I wanted to share with you. So thank you for your attention.